No one else told me they were coming. So, so let's just begin. Let's open with prayer, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, the earliest, man's earliest understanding of God. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, precious Lord, we ask you to be with us tonight. Help us to grow in understanding. Teach us your ways. Fill us with your truth. Let your word resound in our hearts and in our minds and in our mouths. And we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the very uh, beginning of faith, which really begins with man. And when we think about what we know about early man, I guess in a lot of ways it's, it's, it's not much. I went to school, oh goodness gracious, a long time ago, and virtually everything I was taught about uh, anthropology at that point is all uh, dropped by the wayside. Nobody teaches that anymore. But I, you know, I remember uh, being in school and there's this chart you know, of, of uh, how man evolved and it goes through all these stages and it's Peking man, then it's Neanderthal man, then it's human man. And, um, all of that really fell apart when the science of genetics, when the human genome was decoded. And what we discover is that most of these things we all consider to be early man are not early man at all. They're entirely different species. In fact, one paleontologist I read said that, um, uh, you know, 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, um, the earth was a lot like Middle Earth that there were all these different species of hominids that, uh, that shared the planet and that competed for land and resources. Humans, what we now have modern humans, was only one of many different hominid creatures. So there's Peking man was his own species, as was Neanderthals. They were their own species. Fiorensis man, discovered, oh really, probably not until like the 1980s we found remains of Fiorensis man. And um, that was its own species. And in fact, Fiorensis men lived in Polynesia and there are actually some um, old sailors logs that uh, appear to have had some contact with Fiorensis man as, uh, um, you know, as recently as the 16th and 17th century. So, um, it's, it's fascinating that there are all these different creatures, all of which um, were separate species, but they're all hominids. They were, they were like us. But, it's inter but one of the things that's happened is that only humans survived. We're the only species of all these hominids that managed to make it into the modern world. Even though several of them were larger, stronger, had larger cranium capacities than humans did. Perhaps they were smarter, we really don't know. I was just doing some research on the, uh, the cave paintings in France, which I always thought were humans, but actually I discovered, recently they've, just, they've now decided these were Neanderthals. So they had some kind of artistic uh, ability, but yet they could not survive. They all they all died out and only the humans made it. Now, what makes us special? What is it about humans that gives us this ability to continue, to grow, to learn, to create uh, in ways that no other creature has ever been able to do? And quite frankly, it's because the one thing human beings do that no other creature on the planet does is pray. Mankind has a spiritual nature, not only a physical nature, but a spiritual nature. Mankind pray.
praise. Man knows that he needs to reach out to a God that he does not see, does not understand, but knows is there. And wherever you go, anywhere in the world, in the forests of, of Amazon or in, on the islands of the South Pacific or um, in the northern Russian steppes, wherever you go, mankind is reaching out to know a God that he knows is there, but cannot see, nor can he understand. That is incredible that man seeks to commune with his creator. Because what makes man different is not biology. Goodness, we, we share 98.8% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Do you know that? <laughs> We're only 1.2% different from chimpanzees. But I remember uh, back in the 1960s, I, I used to um, you know, follow Jane Goodall, and she got so excited because she observed a chimpanzee using a stick to collect ants to eat them. And she says, look, chimpanzees use tools. And I'm thinking, yeah, but at the same time, we're in the process of sending a man to the moon. <laughs> There's something special. It's probably not included in that 1.2% of DNA. There's something unique about mankind that no other creature on the planet um, has, and that's a spiritual nature. In fact, I, I remember reading one evolutionist saying that mankind could not have evolved on this planet, that we must be from some other place in the universe because we are so remarkably different from every other species. And let's think about it. how many hominids were there? Dozens of different species of hominids. Well, how, but when you look at the other primates, there are dozens of species of all the primates, but yet in the hominid realm, only humans make it. Only humans, and it's because we pray. And that's amazing because there's no evolutionary reason for prayer. You know, when we talk about the survival of the fittest, prayer does not make us more fit. <laughs> prayer does not in any way help feed us. But yet, that is the key ingredient. It's the spirituality that God has poured into us that makes us unique, makes humankind special. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, the story of ancient man in the scriptures is that first 11 chapters of Genesis. And that, those first 11 chapters are so incredibly rich in understanding man's relationship to God. And that's really where we see the foundation of faith. And when we, where we see the foundation of faith, we also see the foundation of the church. Now, Genesis opens with this beautiful song. The first chapter of Genesis I always refer to as a song. And I do that because you can see that it's a versicle and a response or a verse and a chorus. And, you know, it's uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and there was evening and there was morning. Day one. And then it goes on to the second day, evening and morning, day two. And it's really, it's a song about what God did in the very beginning of the universe. And it's a beautiful, beautiful song. And it teaches us two particularly important things about, the, about creation, about the universe. And one of them is that God created all that is from nothing. And the second thing it teaches us that everything God created was good. That stands in stark contrast with the pagan understanding of the universe, the pagan understanding of time. 
in the biblical and Christian, Judeo-Christian understanding of the universe and time, the universe has a beginning and the universe has an end. Now in the pagan understanding of time, which is really built, built upon uh, seasons and, and uh, agricultural cycles, everything moves in a circle, everything moves in a cycle. And it begins and it ends and it and just keeps going. It keeps going around and around and around and it never ends. And in fact, when I was first in school, I was taught that the universe was eternal. It had always been here, it will always be here. It just lasts forever. Had no beginning, had no end. And that is that cyclical, I hate to use the word pagan because that's got such bad connotations, but, but a non-Judeo-Christian view of time is that everything repeats, everything goes around because that's the way the agricultural cycle goes. But in the inspiration of the Judeo-Christian epic in the scriptures, we see it has a beginning and it has an end. Now I have to say, has, did anybody has ever read the books, the, the series of books called The Wheel of Time? I forget who did that, uh, no, Randall Thompson is a composer. But anyway, uh, it's huge, it's like 10 volumes. It's kind of like The Lord of the Rings on uh, steroids. <laughs> But it was a wonderful book, and they're actually going to start a, a series, a television series on it. I see it's advertised on uh, Netflix or something like that, or Prime, The Wheel of Time. And I'm looking forward to watching it because it was really was an amazing, uh, imaginative story. But it was all built upon that concept, the wheel of time. Keeps turning, never stops. Father, jo Father Georges Lemeter a Belgian priest, I believe he was a Jesuit. He was reading this first chapter of Genesis. And he was, not only was he a priest, he was also a very good mathematician, early part of the 20th century. And he begins developing a concept. How did God do this? Now, of course, two of his contemporaries were Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. Albert Einstein developing the theory of relativity, Niels Bohr developing the theory of the atom. And Georges Lemaitre, 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 I have a hard time, it's, it's a Belgian name, it doesn't look, it doesn't, it's not spelled anything like it sounds. <laughs> but he's, he begins to develop a theory of a primordial atom that begins to rapidly expand and all energy from the universe originates in what he calls the primordial atom. He, did the, he presented a paper at um, Southern California, I think the University of Southern California. Albert Einstein was in uh, residence there. He, saw, he heard it and Albert Einstein said, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of the origin of the universe I've ever heard. However, Einstein also said, but we can't give it much credence because it has certain metaphysical repercussions. In other words, if the universe had a beginning and has an end, then a God must exist. Something has to start it. And Albert Einstein, although he was himself was a monist, he believed in, in, in God in a certain way, but he was not ready to take on that concept of, uh, of God actually starting all of this. And so I'd say uh, Father Lamentor was mostly ignored, sometimes laughed at. He gave his, his talk to lots of different symposiums until two scientists from Bell Labs discovered the background cosmic radiation. They renamed Father Lemaitre's theory from the primordial atom to the Big Bang. So a concept of the Big Bang comes straight out of the first chapter of Genesis and it was originated by a Catholic priest. When the universe has a point that it begins and a point that it ends, it must be under the, it has to be under the direction of someone or something of God. 
So then after the, so as we move past that first chapter of Genesis into the second, we begin to see God, uh, a, a different understanding of creation, but it's not really a different uh, creation epic so much as it is a focus on mankind. If the first chapter of Genesis has to do with the creation of the universe, the second chapter has to deal with mankind, the generation of mankind and his relationship with God. And so we begin, we read in the second chapter of Genesis, uh, it's, again, the poetry of these first few chapters of Genesis is just amazing. A mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. In this translation, other translations, a living soul. The breath of God has been, which, and breath and spirit are synonymous, same word in Hebrew, breath as well as in Greek, pneuma in Greek, ruach in Hebrew. The breath of God is placed into man. And there's just imagine that image of God blowing his breath into the nostrils of man and man taking his first breath, which is the breath of God, the spirit of God. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he placed man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers, the Pishon, the Gihon, the Chirakel, and the Parath. I know a lot of, I, you know, of course I, I was in a Protestant evangelical fundamentalist background and people used to look for those rivers and say, well, this must be where Eden was because he found the rivers. Um, the rivers have very highly symbolic meanings. The first means increase. The second means bur bursting forth. The third rapidly and the fourth fruitfulness. So this, there's a concept that God creates man and the first commandment he gives to man is be fruitful and multiply. That the concept is man is to take over the earth. He's to be fruitful, he's to burst forth, to increase and, be, and, and multiply and take over the earth. But in this garden, this garden of Eden, there are two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam has explained, God explains to Adam that the knowledge of good and evil will bring death. Now I always wondered as, as a young Christian lad from a fundamentalist background. You know, my parents spend a lot of time trying to teach me right from wrong. Why is learning right from wrong or good from evil causing death? Well, there's a lot we can go into there, but a, a great part of the of early epics of creation of mankind have to do with why is man different from animals? And part of that is that man sees things differently. We have a sense of right and wrong, good and evil. I mean, just think animals do things that if, if humans do that, we throw them in jail, right? <laughs> because we have this sense of right and wrong, good and evil. But yet that is what brings us death because that is what St. Paul always refers to as the law, the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the law that brings death. And man is given a woman, Eve, because God says it's not good that man should be alone, so I will make him a helper fit for him. And we know the story. Eve is deceived by the serpent. She succumbs to the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam then follows her and they both become fearful and ashamed. And so they clothe themselves and hide from God. And then they leave Eden to go and work on the earth to form a, to form a family and experience pain. A 
point that I've made in, in homilies here, and, and actually I think that that homily is also on, uh, on our Facebook page. I was always taught that God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. God was angry and threw them out. But actually, on a closer reading of the, on the, of the narrative, you realize that's not entirely true. After Adam and Eve had disobeyed, they had taken the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, God comes looking for Adam and Eve. He comes to find them. He desires to, to restore them. But in their fear and shame, they run and hide. They run away from God. It's not that God cast them out of the garden so much as they run out of the garden. They run away from God because they are ashamed. And so it's really not necessarily our sin. It's not our, our sin that separates us from God. I mean, our, I mean, the definition of sin really is separation from God, but it's not our sin that causes that much as it's our shame. It's our shame. It's God never stops desiring to have fellowship with us, to embrace us, to hold us, to be close to us. Just like the scripture talks about God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. It's our shame that, run, that drives us, our fear and our shame that we run from God. And then I love Jesus flips that over on its head in the story of the Good Samaritan. Not the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He goes away and he ruins everything. And when he is penniless and he's broken, he's starving, he starts coming back. And guess what? His father runs to him. Adam and Eve ran from God, but Jesus says, your father desires to run to you. It's beautiful the way these stories intertwine. But anyway, one of the things, I, a point I want to make about the Adam and Eve story, because we're really talking about early man, not talking about the theology of grace. And that is why we see this as a Bible story, because it is in the Bible, but it predates the Bible by thousands of years. In fact, the oldest temple ever so far ever excavated is currently still being excavated. It's in southern Turkey. It's called the, Gable, it's called the Gableki Tepe, which is its location, which I think means pig belly hill. I mean, <laughs> but that's the location. And it's, a, it's an ancient, ancient, ancient temple, 12,000 years old. So that means this temple was built at the close of the last ice age. That's how old this thing is. And it was built when mankind was still a hunter gatherer. Now, if you ever study the history of religion, you know that what they say that man became um, agrarian when began planting crops and, be, and began developing these religions all, that all are about the fertility cycle of the crocs. Well, that's kind of paganism because it's all about those cycles. But this predates that. Man is not an agricultural be uh, uh, community at that point. He's still a hunter-gatherer. And this temple is built, well, it's a stone representation of the Garden of Eden. And right in the center of this temple are these two enormous stone trees. And then all around them are concentric circles of smaller trees. And they're all very, they're, they're all carved. Um, you know, you've got birds and animals and, and some of which I'm not, I mean, I, I see what ar archeologists say they are, but I'm not sure that's true. But anyway, they've got lots of birds and animals carved in. A man's carved on one of them, which is kind of interesting. I'm not certain if we can build it. There's a image of the cross there 12,000 BC. I think that would be difficult. But anyway, there's, um, there are all these different images, but it's all about working your way through these concentric circles of trees to the center trees, the two principal trees in the center, of course, which is the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what we have in our 
scriptures as Genesis chapters 2 and 3, this, this Garden of Eve narrative is very likely the liturgy of the worship of early man. Because it's all built on this story. I mean, we have it in the Bible, but it predates the, the Bible by so many tens of thousands of years. And so this is how early man worshiped was a recalling of this event in the garden. Now that makes sense because what is our worship? Our worship is a recalling of Christ with his last, with his disciples at the Last Supper and his passion, that salvific event. And the two are linked so closely, so closely. We'll get to that in a minute. But two things that we notice about the Gebleki Tepe is that there, there are no idols. Idolatry does not exist. And idolatry comes to being, comes to light around the second millennium BC. Up until then, man worshiped God as spirit, exactly how the first, two, first three chapters of Genesis describe him. God worships, man worships God as spirit. And he understands that all of creation is a gift from God. All of creation is good. This is what we learn in these first chapters. Because what the first chapters of Genesis are built upon is this very, very ancient faith that actually is the Catholic faith. We're just not going to call it Catholic for another 12,000 years, but yeah, that's exactly what it is. So what do we learn from this story? First, that God created man to enjoy a special relationship with him. Remember, he, he creates man by breathing his spirit into his nostrils. The tree of life gives us a promise of eternal life. God gave man dominion over the earth and over all the animals. That's why in the Gebleki Tepe you see the animals etched all the way around, all around. And man became separated from God because of his embrace of the law, good from evil. It's interesting, in the Babylonian epic of creation, man's name is Enkidu, Adam is Enkidu, which actually means God is good. But Enkidu runs and plays with the animals. He runs around naked playing with the animals all the time. Remember, Adam and Eve weren't work very close. So there was, he's running around naked playing with the animals. He is then seduced by the Eve figure who does not have a name. And she teaches him how to make bread and wine. Interesting. Agricultural. Bread and wine. Because as soon as man learns how to make bread and wine... He can establish cities, he can establish settlements, and as soon as he has cities and settlements, he can create armies and go take over other settlements. In the Babylonian event of the uh, story of the fall, the fall is a good thing because now we have civilization, we have empires, we have kings. And remember the very first empire builder in history in the Babylonian epic is named Gilgamesh. He's probably the same character that the scripture refers to as Nimrod because in the Babylonian concept, the world is there to be taken. And in the Judeo-Christian epic, the world is there to be given. And it's interesting, um, I have a friend who's an Algonquin Indian in Canada and I was showing him some photographs of the, of the etchings on, uh, of the, from the Gebleki Tepe. And he says, oh yeah, we have these exact same pictures <laughs> in, their, in their Algonquin reservation. And he says, we don't let any white men know where they are because the Canadian government will come and make a national park out of it and take away our land. <laughs> but remember, the Native Americans came from Central Asia and made their way across 
the Bering Strait to come into North America. So these people who built the Gobleki Tepe are really probably ethnically the same as those who made their way across. And that's why we see such stark similarities in their art and in their culture. And how do the, Ameri how do the Native Americans worship God? God is spirit. Creation is good. We're here to share. See, they pick, the Native Americans are probably a very close, the religion of Native Americans is probably very close to the religion of these individuals who built the Gobleki Tepe 12,000 years ago. We're gonna continue here in the Garden of Eden story. When man and Eve fall, we receive the first proclamation of the gospel. It's called the first proclamation of gospel. It's Genesis chapter 3, 14 and 15. And this is what it says. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the essence of the Catholic faith. That the seed of the woman, and it's interesting that the scripture says this, it's the seed of the woman that defeats the serpent. Which is really, it's a, it's, it's a prophecy of a virgin birth. It's not the seed of a man, it's the seed of a woman that defeats the serpent. And this concept is reflected in a lot of mytho mythologies around the world. Marduk, uh, he defeats Tiamat the dragon, and who is the, Tiamat who is the dragon of chaos, the god of chaos, that's the Mesopotamia. Uh, in the Greek, Myth, it is laid on the serpent dragon who guards the, gold, the tree of golden fruit. And he is defeated by Hercules, son of, the, son of a god, goddess. Zodiac, in the Zodiac, the virgin, you know, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio make up that quadrant of the, of the Zodiac some scholars say this is actually a reflection of this first proclamation of the gospel that the virgin gives birth to the judge who then defeats the scorpion, represented as a scorpion there rather than a dragon or a serpent. But scorpion, dragon, serpent, whatever they're called, and I think dragon's probably the, close, the, the best translation of it, um, we see that it's the virgin who brings forth the victor. And it's interesting when we compare Eve to Mary and Adam to Jesus, what do we see here? Both of these, because Eve was, um, was deceived and she disobeyed. But Mary hears the truth from the voice of an angel and she gives her obedience, be it done to me according to your word. Eve, Eve listens to the serpent, Mary listens to the angel and she tells us to listen to her son, do whatever he tells you. Eve becomes the natural mother of all the living and Mary becomes the spiritual mother of all the faithful and really of all the world. Adam, the Bible says Adam was a son of God. He is God's created son. Christ is God's begotten son. Adam disobeys, Christ obeys. He prays in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. It's an amazing, at this point, you see this narrative taking place in the two gardens the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Adam rebels in the Garden of Eden. Christ submits in the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam, when he is, when God says, what have you done? He blames his wife. He says, the woman gave it to me. <laughs> but then Christ takes on the sin of the world. Adam is, separates from the Garden of Eden. But Christ becomes the gate into paradise, the gate into the new Garden of Eden, which is heaven. Fascinating, I mean, so much time I'm taking up. It's fascinating how much we learn in these very, very early chapters. Okay. Then as Genesis goes on, we get all the begats. Ever wondered why the Bible spends so much time in genealogies? Who's whose father and who's whose father? And he lived for 600 years, lived for 700 years, and he gave you a son. And we began by talking about early man and there are the, all these other hominids, the Neanderthals, the Pekings, the Ferences, all these different kinds of human-like creatures. And when you live in a world where there are lots of different hominids, being able to prove that you're human, memorize your genealogy so you can say, I'm human. I'm so-and-so son or so-and-so, you know, you can prove that you're human. When I discovered that, I thought, oh, this makes sense. And there was inter action between the two. In fact, Europeans are about 4% Neanderthal. Do you know that? Europeans are 4% Neanderthal. Africans are only about 1% because there was not a lot of uh, interplay between the Neanderthals in Africa. But there are a few interesting characters in the, uh, in those, uh, in those, those lengths of, um, of genealogies, Peleg, in whose days the earth was divided, which is all that we have of what must have been an amazing story of earthquake or, or just the separation of the earth was divided in the days of Peleg, which is kind of interesting. Jubal invents musical instruments and becomes uh, the founder of praise, jubilation, you know, um, jubilate, we still use the, uh, his name and then we have the Noah story. And again, my point with the Noah story, you know the story. And in fact, a lot of mythologists refer to the Noah story as, or the, the flood epic, as a creation story. And you uh, can see this particularly uh, among some of the, the Polynesians, cosmogenies, where um, you have a bird or a fish or something dives down and brings up mud and the mud comes out of the waters and the earth is created. I don't, th I don't think the flood story is a, is, a, is a creation story. I think probably the, those Polynesians are called the earth diver myths. The earth divers probably have to do with volcanic activity creating islands and people observe this and they create the stories about them. But again, what to note about the Noah story, the flood epic, is that it's not a Bible story. It's in the Bible, but it is a story of ancient man. That story of the flood um, is literally all over the world. It's in China, uh, Babylon, India, Greece, Native America, South America, even in Africa, every place that exists, they have this story of flood, which gives us some sense of the timing of it. One of the interesting things about studying ancient man is that for tens of thousands of years, man was one family living in one spot on the earth. Now, how do we know that? We know that really, again, because of genetics. Since the human genome has been um, decoded, we've learned a great more about early man. One of the odd things, because when I, was, when I went to, uh, of course I was raised, believed that the Adam and Eve story is literally true. This is exactly the way it happened and we're out looking for the Garden of Eden, you know. Um, 
And then, of course, you know, you go to, you go to theology school, you go to seminary, and you thought, well, it's, it's just an allegory. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a historical fact, but it teaches us the nature of salvation and grace and teaches us so many things. So, okay, good. Then geneticists come around and they say, well, actually, we've tested people from all over the world and everybody on the planet descends from a, one man and one woman. And they call that one man Y chromosomal Adam, because that's how they trace it all. They trace it through Y chromosomes. Uh, the woman they call mitochondrial E, because they trace um, female genetics through the mitochondria. However, Y chromosomal Adam, they tell us, lived about 250,000 BC. Mitochondrial Eve lived about 200,000 BC. So there's like a 50,000 year gap. So obviously it's not the Adam and Eve of the, of the Old Testament. But what it does teach us is that early man for at least those 50,000 years and probably for some time longer existed as a single family. It was one family in one location. Now, when you have, when all humankind is one family, one tribe, and they're living somewhere, and suddenly there is this enormous flood, then the flood covers all the land, all the, it, all the earth. The, word, the Hebrew word for earth there is Eretz, which is, it can be translated so many different ways, but planet earth is probably one way it should never be translated. It's not referring to the planet. It really refers to the land where man is. It's a, a place for man, a land for man. So sometimes it's, plan, it's re, translated land, Sometimes it's translated Israel. Israel to this day refers to, they refer to themselves as Haaretz, the, the land. But this flood narrative, again, is extremely, extremely ancient. And when you trace, I'm not going to read all the different narratives too, but basically in the various narratives, there are three ways people survive. One is they build a boat like Noah. All right, and the Babylonian epic also has a boat. Um, one other way is that man becomes a fish. That's in, the, in India, the, the epic, the, the, those who save are saved because they become fish, which I think translates, they learned how to swim. <laughs> they figured out how to swim. And then the third way that some people are saved is that they make it to the mountains. And in China, that's how mankind is saved. So you have this incredible event that brings about tremendous destruction. But from that event, a few were saved. We're going to see that narrative uh, repeat again and again throughout scriptures where not everybody gets saved. Many perish. But even Jesus says, many perish, but few are chosen. You know, the way, the way is wide that leads to destruction, but narrow that leads to life. There is a sense in, in which life is tough. All, all through the scriptures, there's always a remnant. There's always a salvation. And so we'll see that narrative again and again as we go through the scriptures. Stepping just like one quick step back to the Gebleki Tepe, southern Turkey, we begin to see more later reproductions of that same temple through various parts of Mesopotamia, uh, even into the Jordan River Valley and along the Ural Steppes, you'll find this, this same, a, rep a, re a reproduction of that same temple in Turkey, only on a smaller scale, several, several places. And you get to a place called Akkad in northern Mesopotamia. 
where um, Akkad began to a, become a very powerful tribe and began to spread out and develop the Akkadian Empire. And as that Akkadian Empire begins to spread, they, they conquer Sumer, they take over Sumer in the south and begin to colonize Sumer. There's an Akkadian prince by the name of Abraham, or Abram at the time. He and his father Terah moved to Sumer, and when they get to Sumer, they discover that the Sumerians have idols. And that's what we'll talk about next week. <laughs> We begin to discover Abraham, idolatry, and the foundation of what we call monotheism. Monothe Abraham didn't invent monotheism, but he championed it in an age when the world was turning to idols. Any questions? Did I take up all my time? No, only 45 minutes. That's a Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that actually is a, uh, I've heard that theory before that, that the flood destroyed all the other hominids. Um, although hominids were pretty wide. I mean, we've got hominids in Peking and in Polynesia. So it's, it's a pretty, it's pretty widespread. My own theory about where the flood took place, how, what the flood was, is that there used to be a very lush river valley running um, north of Turkey and um, at some point uh, there was a, an earthquake or, or something created what we now know as the Dardanelles and the Mediterranean Sea came flooding and flooded that entire place and now we now know it as the Black Sea. But they actually have found remains of a human civilization you know, in the very bottom of the Black Sea. So there were people living in that region uh, before it was flooded and became the Black Sea. So I think that that may be what the, the scriptures are, 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 all these different legends talk about, but that'd be a huge flood. <laughs> you know, the whole Mediterranean flooding in. You could also kind of picture the, if the Straits of Gibraltar had been joined at one time and opened up in what we now know as the Mediterranean, but you have these events where entire oceans or seas are created at one time. And... Um, so yeah, so tremendous destruction and devastation and only a few survive. Well, at this point, I believe the, the flood took place when man was still living in one area. But you mentioned that all areas are talking about this event. That's because Mankind moved out, emigrated from uh, Central, um, Central Asia into other parts of the earth. And the flood may have very been, well been a cause of that emigration. Yeah. No. That these are symbols that were common in the human culture at the time, and a lot of people would read on those symbols and what they meant. And so it would have made sense for the author to use those similar symbols to already identify this like water being a source of life, also a source of renewal in the world. Of course, that would be vastly different than 
Yeah, virtually all cultures have the flood story. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's really the reason that most historians will tell you that the re this is a real event. We're not sure when it happened or what exactly it was, but it's just all over the world. So it had to have happened a long, long time ago when all of mankind lived pretty much in the same place and it had to be an enormous event. But we do see archeological, you know, some archeological evidence of, um, like I say, of settlements in the bottom of the Black Sea. A lot of settlements in the bottom of the Mediterranean too, but there's so much geo uh, physical activity there where islands are created and sink that I don't know that, that that's, uh, would point to the same thing. But it is, uh, but it, but Jerry, it, but my point really is, God has revealed himself to man from the very, very beginning. And these first 11 chapters are, are, are our record of that revelation. Now, you also have you know, myths and stories in a number of other cultures, but you'll discover that they're pretty similar, that, they pretty, that they'll be telling the same story using similar symbols or different symbols by different cultures. But uh, yeah, but this is the story of early man. But what I find most fascinating is the revelation of redemption to early man. That the, that the, one, the seed of the woman will defeat the serpent or the dragon, depending upon your culture. That's just fascinating. That is so powerful that 10,000, 12,000 BC, mankind was looking for a Messiah. The Messianic promise begins at the Garden of Eden, at the very foundation of mankind. And from that point on, they're waiting for the seed of the woman who will defeat the serpent or the dragon. That's just amazing. Any other questions? Are we good? Let's close with prayer. <laughs> you can ask more questions. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've gathered us here together to learn and to grow. Come speak into our hearts. Help us to always seek your truth know your truth, and live by your truth. And Blessed Mother, we give you thanks that you are the virgin who brought forth the seed of the woman who defeated the dragon, defeated falsehood and deception and destruction. And so we pray together, seeking your intercession, Blessed Mother, Hail Mary, Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>